You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy app. Thank you so much for joining me on this fine Thursday. So we are officially two weeks away from uh, the start of training camp. Two weeks, six hours, and 18 minutes from the moment that I'm recording this. The training camp will begin. That's exciting, man. I know. I'd see. That's that's what annoys me too, because I'm excited for training camp, and it's like, ooh, it's coming. And then you go on Twitter, and it's like, oh, only 67 days until football. It's like you shush over there, because I can't make it 60 days. I, I will just collapse on the floor and start convulsing. Stop telling me that. You're harming my health. I'd like to see 60. All right. According to some actuarial table out there, I'm supposed to make it to like 80. You telling me that craziness? I'm not going to see Christmas. Stop saying crazy things. You know, 60 days until football. Don't believe their lies, ladies and gentlemen. We have two weeks. Two weeks until football madness. And then we get four straight days of Green Bay Packers training camp information. And even better than that, we get all kinds of really good information, because that's usually what happens. Somebody probably tweaks, tweaks their hamstring, which is going to be really bad information. But everybody's going to be awesome, with the exception of Aaron Rodgers, who by the end of the four days will have thrown 84 interceptions. But otherwise, whew, the defensive backs will have, like, you know, well, a lot of interceptions. Reporters will be talking about how everybody would have had a sack if we were actually playing football. You know, just all good stuff. I can't wait. And then it's only about a week or so after that, I mean, a little bit more, but we're going to call it a week because I want to call it a week. About a week after that, we play against the Houston Texans in that joint practice. Two days of joint practice, which I've never seen before. I mean, not in any capacity that I care about. I've heard about other teams doing it, and it sounds awesome, but the Packers aren't doing it, so I don't care. But now the Packers are doing it for two straight days, so we get new crazy fun information. And then after a day off, we play in our first preseason game against the Texans. And yes, I said we. I'm one of those people. If you don't like it, get away from me because I'm tired of hearing you complain about it. I am fully aware I don't play for this team. Same people complain about that are the same ones you see on Facebook arguing with you about, you know, the different ways to spell their. Like, yeah, I know your is not you are, dude. I know how to spell it. I'm not dumb. I just don't care. Anyways, isn't it funny how I just get into arguments with nobody? Nobody's correcting me about anything, and I'm just yelling at everybody. Stop judging me. Anyways, I'm jacked up. I'm excited. It also means in two weeks I will have made it through the entire offseason and I wasn't sure I can do it. And guess what? I did it. I took a few days off and at some point I should probably get back to my two-a-days so I can get caught up to my 365-day-a-year thing. But regardless, I made it through. So if you wouldn't mind, take a moment, give me an applause. Just wherever you are, if you're driving, pull over real quick and just just clap. That is my my call to action of the day. I'm sorry, I'm just picturing people sitting at their desk clapping like a seal with their co-workers staring at them like they're crazy. Oh, I need a hobby of some kind. Any suggestions, you're welcome. Why don't we just take our break, and then we'll start talking about football. I will be right back. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So obviously we did not get uh, the safety of our dreams, which to be fair, the only reason there was as much hype as there was is because there's nothing going on. As I said, it would be nice to add talent. It's always nice to add talent. But what you don't want to do is overpay. And that is the one thing I really like about Brian Gutekunst. That scares me a little bit because I know he's aggressive, but the question is, is he going to be overly aggressive? And I haven't really seen that. Still a little shaky about the Khalil Mack thing. That, to me, is a little over-aggressive. I know a lot of Packer fans are probably still a little mad that we didn't get him, but uh, I think I'm going to be all right with it. But this was seemingly a situation, and I don't know for sure. It's possible they brought him in and they just didn't really like him, right? They really, really wanted to do their due diligence, which is one thing we know about Brian Gutekunst, which is why we probably shouldn't necessarily jump to they really liked him. Maybe they just really were doing their due diligence, right? They, they, this is basically the only guy that's available. Why wouldn't you want to be the most prepared to make sure you have the right answer? So you have a meeting with him, you fly him to Green Bay, you give him a physical in person, you watch him and you work him out and do all this. Why not? And then at the end of the day, rather than looking at it and saying, we've put a lot of work into this guy, we should probably offer way too much to make sure we get him. In other words, the level of intensity towards him and and the preparation for him is less about we really, really want them, and more about we really, really, really want to put the right value on them. And it's possible that they had bid the same bid that the Cardinals did, but the Cardinals have just a higher priority. Meaning if the Cardinals maybe didn't put a bid on them in that, and, and who knows, maybe a lot of teams did. But the bottom line is I'm sure the Packers probably had a pretty good idea what the outcome would be. If they felt he was worth a fourth round, they would have put a fourth round. Maybe they were even hoping he would have been worth a fourth round. But he just, at the end of the day, didn't warrant that high of a pick. They put what they thought was the right value. And they probably knew that somebody else, and, and a lot of the teams would have a similar value, and that one of the teams with a higher you know, order than them would have got. And, and even that is an assumption. Again, maybe they just didn't really value it. Maybe they thought 6th, 7th, or just undrafted was a better value for them. But it does alleviate some, because there are GMs, as we all know, that if they want somebody... It's not even so much about evaluating the talent. It's just, I want him, and they'll overpay. And although it, it may work in the short term, overall, that that sort of philosophy is what's going to ruin a team. Because you can only do that so many times before suddenly you get to a point where there's just there's nothing left to work with. right? Now there's a guy that you do want and you do need that is a good value, but you can't even afford him anymore because you've overpaid the last four guys that you brought on your team. Or you, you know, like the Amari Cooper thing, I think a first round is a little steep. I know he's pretty good, and I know that it kind of worked out that the team did get better after they brought in Amari Cooper, and they are a better team. You're always going to be a better team when you do that. It's just a question of value. Was it worth a first round pick? No, I don't think it was. Debatable, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. Now, see, and then in the moment, it's like, oh, of course that was the right thing to do. But then you go into the draft, you don't have a first round pick. Now you got to start looking at the, the cost benefit of what did you just lose out on. And it's not like the Cowboys haven't been doing a good job. The last draft prior to that, they got Leighton Van Der Esch in the first round. Do you think for one second they'd give up Leighton? I mean, just, just if they had the opportunity to choose between Leighton Van Der Esch or Amari Cooper that they would take Amari Cooper, I don't think in a million years any of the 32 teams would make that decision. Even even though a, you know, a wide receiver is probably more valuable, than a linebacker, Leighton Van Der Esch is just unbelievably unique. I don't think Amari is quite that. Anyways, I'm, I'm off in the weeds, as always. Point is, as much as it would have been nice to bring him in, it's nice to see that Gutekunst was using his discretion, and that rather than getting super hyped and saying, we, we have to go around earlier to make sure we get him, we have to put in a fourth to make sure we're the team, 
he says, nope, we're going to put in the value that we find to be best. We're probably not going to get him, but we have to be okay with that. So good on him. As for the Cardinals, you know, I don't know. They, they definitely need help, but they also went out and got a lot of help. So it sort of becomes a situation where you've got a lot of people and it's not for sure if any of them are really good. And now you've just added somebody else into the mix that's, I don't know. You, you just got a pile of people that maybe none of them are going to be any good, but you hope maybe one of them is at least going to be kind of good. And as a person who's obsessed with the draft, um, pretty excited that uh, we didn't lose a draft pick. But it will be interesting to, to monitor him because obviously that's going to be an opportunity where if he blows up, Packer fans are going to lose it and call Gutekunst a piece of garbage. My only comment to you would be if you really really liked him because you watched him and thought he was awesome and you said we should have put a fourth round draft pick on or or, you know value on him then you can go out and brag about it but if you're content with this right now and then you blow up come on man don't do that monday morning quarterbacking stuff it's boring and it's obnoxious so go ahead and get in the facebook group and let it be known right now i wanted him we should have got him he was awesome and the only reason i say that you do that so that it's documented. Also, if he's a bust, we can go back and make fun of you. As long as you accept the terms, I'm good with you getting a little hostile and throwing shade at Gutekunst if it doesn't work out. I also think we should remember that there are still quite a bit of free agents out there. Um, And I think, you know, as much as we might look at it and say, hey, why don't you just go out and get Eric Berry? Why don't you just go out and get Trey Boston? Whatever. I think some of the teams, including the Packers, need to kind of sort through some stuff. And one of the things the Packers need to sort through is the Josh Jones situation. Because Josh Jones kind of solves all the problems. And I know he isn't, hasn't been a very good football player. But if we were to find a safety, we're basically looking for Josh Jones. We're looking for that box safety. But, I, you know, the, the Packers need an opportunity to kind of sort through them, some things. Find out what they have on the roster. Find out what they need. Try to find those players that we can fill in the roster that that Mike Pettin is basically looking at his playbook and saying, look, you know, the the playbook that we can execute goes from, you know, a a six to a nine if we can add this one piece. You know, we're we're limited right now based on what we're able to do because we have a a big hole right here. And that has become a pretty big part of, of, you know, football in general and, and defenses is that box safety. Because of, you know, what tight ends can do, you got to have somebody that's versatile. You know, tight ends that can block and catch make it tough to decide, do you put a safety or a linebacker on them? Which is why you need both. Offenses are always looking to find ways to to be a matchup problem. And defense's job is to find out ways to match the matchup. And so I think teams are usually pretty good at uh, hiding their cards, but every once in a while they sort of tip their hand and... You know, the one area that it's pretty clear that the Packers maybe aren't super excited about is is tight end. And again, we don't know. We don't know exactly what we have, and maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised, including the coaches and everybody else, but they've been pretty aggressive in trying to find something at tight end. I don't know what. I don't know if it's a piece. I don't know if it's what it is. But also, you look at the, the amount of attention given to this safety, And again, maybe it's just general due diligence, or maybe it's due diligence because we really need somebody and he might fill that role. But at the end of the day, if things do get desperate, there are players who can come in and fill uh, that situation. But either way, at the end of the day, this is a better defense than the Packers have had in some time. At least on paper it is. So if we're missing a piece here or a piece there, and, and let's be honest, considering the talent level of Josh Jones the last couple of years, it's not like we've really had that piece in prior years anyways. I know a lot of Packers, you know, pundits, whatever you want to call them, reporters have been talking about, well, Josh Jones isn't great in coverage, but he's been a great, basically, linebacker. And ta- not really. He's just all around not been great. He's got a ton of potential, just we, we haven't really seen it. He can fly, but as I've said before, speed is... is eh, there's a clip out there, and I, I, I shouldn't reference clips because I can't show you, and, and describing it doesn't really do any justice. But somebody threw it up on Twitter, and it was Luke Keekley, and essentially it's it's a, the, the kind of thing where the offense all flows to the left, and then they the running back ends up running to the right. I think it was actually the, the offensive line flows to the left, and then they pitched it to the right to the running back. Luke Keekley was on the offense's left, and there was another linebacker to the offense's right, and essentially what happens is the linebackers both start flowing to the offense's left, and then both of them, when they realize what's happening, start running 
to the offense's right to go get the running back. Luke Keekley beats the other linebacker there. Now, he does have a faster um, straight line speed, seemingly, but more importantly than that was the reaction time. The ability to diagnose and see what's going on and change direction. That split-second difference had more to do with Luke Keekley's quote-unquote speed than anything else. That's what's missing with Josh Jones. It's the mental part of it. You know, if, if this was just basically dodgeball, you know, where you put your hand against the wall and it's like you got to run in a straight line to be the first one to get the ball before the other guy gets it and smacks you in the mouth with it, Josh Jones would be pretty good because he's got straight line speed and it's just a matter of somebody saying, okay, go, or, you know, however you're going to indicate that it's time to start running. But in football, nobody's telling you when to go or where to go or what angle to go. And all those things matter. And if you're a half a second slower at recognizing things, you're going to get there later, despite the fact that you have faster straight line speed. I mean, Josh Jones runs a 4-4-2. Luke Keekley ran a 4-5-8. If they both played on the same team, Luke Keekley would get to the ball nine times out of ten before Josh Jones ever did. The point is, we, we see the flashes, right? It's Well, I'm, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. I almost did it again, trashing this certain particular person. We'll get to that because I got scolded for it. But sometimes you get enamored by the flashes, right? You know, when, when he makes a big play and you watch the highlight and, and the replay, it's like, wow, this guy is really, really good. The problem is he did that once, and then the other four times when he should have been able to do that because of his athletic ability, he didn't. He didn't see it. He didn't make the right decision. He's not sure, should I drop? Should I, you know, go down and get him? But on the in those instances, sim- similar to Kevin King in a way, Kevin King has the tools to be an elite cornerback, and there's no question about that. If he could ever reach his full potential, he will be the best corner on this team. His his height, his speed, his length, everything about him is just next level. It's just a matter of can he put it together. And we've seen some stuff out of him that's like, oh my goodness. And not just the Julio Jones game. I'm talking about instances and plays where he just diagnoses things and you, know, the, you see the speed on full display. But the inconsistency is the problem. Doing it once makes for a great highlight reel. Doing it once out of every, you know, seven plays kind of makes you a bad football player. And Luke Keekley doing it, you know, nine out of every ten plays is what makes him an elite linebacker. That's part of what makes this whole scouting thing so hard because a lot of times when you're watching, you see really good football players and you see the athleticism and you see the highlight reels. But the hard thing to do is to really, and, and I, who was it that just did, um, Michael Lombardi, I think is his name. They've got that podcast, but that was, oh, it, no, it, it was Scott McLuhan, I think is how you pronounce his name. I was listening to a podcast, and he was on there, the old GM of the Washington Redskins, an ex-Packers guy, but he was talking about that, you know, scouting talent is easy. He said everybody knows what, what when you see talent, as far as being a scout, which is part of the reason, well, whatever, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but he says everybody can see it. Everybody can see what good football looks like. He said real scouting comes down to getting to know the player. Are they going to work? Are they going to study? Are they going to do all these things? That's essentially the the question mark with Rashawn Gary, and that's the problem why pe- certain people don't like him, because they saw the production and they said it wasn't good enough. Packers don't care. Packers saw talent. Everybody saw talent. The question for them was, is he going to be the kind of guy that's going to translate that talent into production? Is he going to be a worker? Is he going to you know study? Is he going to get there? Because if he does, he's Daniil Hunter for the Green Bay Packers. Because it's not just about the, the athleticism and the, the, the on-field talent like Josh Jones has. The hardest part of scouting is figuring out if they're going to be able to take that talent and translate that into being a good football player in the NFL, which is almost entirely a mental thing. right? If, if, well, once you get in, you have the athleticism, that's already there. right? That's the baseline. Cool, you're athletic and you can do these things. You, you've got this baseline talent, whatever. The next question is, can you grow, right? Devontae Adams is a perfect case study for that. Nothing really special about Devontae Adams is in terms of his you know, athleticism. The Packers and everybody in the scouting community saw the tools. They saw the, what he had to work with, but it just became a question of could he grow, and the Packers answered that question, yes. Ted Thompson and his staff looked at him and said, he's going to be a guy who's going to use these tools and, and really grow. Now, it took him a while. Right, He came into the NFL, wasn't working out too great for a while. But as of right now, is one of the top wide receivers in the NFL. Whatever rank you want to put on him doesn't matter. It's it's indisputable that he's very good. So I guess that kind of becomes, bringing this full circle, the the question for Josh Jones. And it's also part of the reason why, you you know, occasionally, and it's very rare, 
uh, especially for the Packers. But you look at what happened, for example, with Vince Beagle. He was gone instantly, man. I mean, he played a year, and he wasn't good enough, and he didn't get playing time, and then the next year he was cut. The Packers were watching him develop and basically said, look, this guy just doesn't have it. And we, we've invested a lot of time in a lot of play. I mean, undrafted free agents who have not really shown very much have stuck around longer than Vince Beagle. For whatever reason, the Packers just watched him and said, this guy's never going to make it. He's just not good enough. And with the Packers still hanging on to Josh Jones, despite his um, protests and everything else, and I, I still think he's going to be gone, but you know, part of me does wonder, I, I wonder if he's about to take that leap and we're about to miss out on it. Anyways, let's take uh, one more quick little break, and uh, we'll come back, and I want to clarify something that was asked in the Facebook group. So as much as I'd like to try to get away from it, because I'm trying not to hammer the same things over and over and over again, uh, Ben in the Facebook group asked the question, he says, so help me out here, and please don't kill me. Why is Trubisky getting skewered on this podcast every day? Statistically, he took a major step last year. He shows first-year quarterback rating 31.6, second-year quarterback rating 72.8. Touchdown 7 compared to 24, yards per game 182.8 to 230.2. He says these are major improvements, and I'm not arguing that he's a stud, but he's better than average, and everyone wants to say he's garbage. Help me out here. Honest question, why is Trubes looked at like a guy who's going to be a top 10 to 12 quarterback going forward? Excuse me, why isn't he looked at as a guy who's going to be top 10 to 12 quarterback going forward? So I've kind of touched on it already, but essentially, in my opinion, statistics are, well, it's not really an opinion that statistics are flawed, but it's more that it's incomplete information. Just as an extreme example, just to give you an illustration, Aaron Rodgers' stats in 2017 were terrible. Why? Because he's hurt, right? For example, you showed touchdowns. How many touchdowns did Aaron Rodgers have in 2017? Well, he only had 16. That's not very good. And then in 2018, he had 25. So obviously 25 is better than 16, right? Well, that's true until you look at the context, which is the fact that Aaron Rodgers only played in seven games. If you look at that and then take his 16 touchdowns over seven games and extrapolate that over 16 games, he would have 36 and a half. Basically, we'll just call it, well, whatever. We'll call it 36 touchdowns. Now compare 36 to 25 and which was better. Suddenly 2017 is better. So primarily what I'm saying about Mitch Trubisky is on the surface, the more surface level, the more broad, the more we kind of just squint our eyes and just look at the very top, the better he looks. The more you dig, the more you get advanced statistics, the more you look at, for example, grades, which again is just people watching his film and saying, was did he do a good job on that play or a bad job on that play? The more you dig into him as a football player, the worse it gets for Mitch Trubisky. And all I'm doing is, is no different than essentially what you're doing, and it's fine. Everybody has an opinion, and who cares? But I'm just explaining that when I'm making my determination on whether somebody is good or bad, it has nothing to do with the fact that he's wearing a Bears helmet and Aaron Rodgers wears a Packers helmet. Khalil Mack wears a Bears helmet. I have no problem saying the guy is phenomenal. Akeem Hicks wears a Bears helmet. I think possibly a hair overrated, but very, very, very good defensive lineman. And the only reason I say that is because, if, if I, I, he, in my opinion, he gets way more attention than, than Kenny Clark does. In that respect, he's overrated. Kenny Clark is miles ahead. And if we're talking about pass rush ability, Mike Daniels is ahead of Akeem Hicks. But what a... <laughs> Anyways, Akeem Hicks is very good also. Maybe I can't say nice things about the Bears. I don't know. I don't like their wide receivers. I like their head coach, though. So he wears a, he wears a shirt. But really, that, that's all it comes down to. I don't value statistics without context. And when you look at a higher passer rating in the context of the fact that Matt Nagy came in and simplified this this uh, offensive system so that his primary job is to throw little dink and dunk five-yard passes. Everybody does better in those kinds of systems. Everybody would improve in that kind of a system. I need more information as to whether or not he was a better football player. And according to Pro Football Focus, not only did his advanced metrics regress which is an extreme statement in and of itself, because the assumption is, the, the, the debate seems to be whether or, or, or a question of how much better he got, right? Everybody just says, well, he definitely took a step. It's just a question of whether he took a step into being a good quarterback or whether he still has some work to do. I'm going that extra step and saying, I don't think he got better. 
I think the offense got simplified. I think his offensive play caller, his head coach, has has done a very, very good job of of directing the talent that he has and making it be more productive. But I don't think that means Mitch Trubisky got more talented. And and again, similar to other things that I've said, I if I'm a Bears fan, I'm concerned about that. And I'm certainly not celebrating Mitch Trubisky. I'm excited about the possibility that he does get better, and I've said that repeatedly. I'm not stating he's always going to be trash. And also, because of the level of their defense, he doesn't need to be Aaron Rodgers. He doesn't need to take a massive step, necessarily. He just needs to be maybe a top 15 quarterback, possibly even top 20, if you look at what Peyton Manning was doing in his last year, when that defense just dragged him and that offense into the Super Bowl to win it. When they literally, literally, the defense on more than one occasion scored more points than the offense. Maybe Trubisky just being a top 20 quarterback at least gives them a shot. The problem is PFF graded him as the 33rd best quarterback out of 32, by the way. I mean, it's not actually out of 32, but there's 32 teams, man. If you're not top 32 out of 32 teams, that's really, really bad. Really, really, really bad. And it's his second year. It's not like he's a rookie. It's not like, well, whatever. It's his first year. I mean, we could do that with with Rosen if we want. But, I mean, you know, if Josh Rosen gets a top-tier play caller like Matt Nagy to come in and surround you with talent like, you know, Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen, and even though the wide receivers aren't necessarily elite, they're all, they're good, it's a good group. Overpaid, but it's a good group. You surround Josh Rosen with all that, and it's his second year, and it's a simplified offense, and he has a very good offensive line, which Rosen had probably one of the worst offensive lines last. If, if he gets all those upgrades and still is terrible, in fact, goes backwards a little bit, suddenly we're changing the conversation. Suddenly I'm not defending Rosen quite as much. Suddenly it's becoming, okay, now I'm worried. First year, not so worried. After two years of this, he's not getting better. I'm starting to get a little bit worried. Um, ben goes on a little bit further to say that a 72 quarterback rating isn't bad, which again, those are statistics that come in, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that right? Completions, which it depends on how complicated the target is, whether or not your wide receivers are wide open or not. Aaron Rodgers is a very good quarterback, but his statistics all went down because he had wide receivers that couldn't get open. Having guys like Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb be able to find ways to get open on these scramble drills helps Aaron Rodgers' statistics, not because it makes, not because he's a better quarterback, but because of other people around him. And those are the kinds of things you need to eliminate from the equation. And that's the thing that I can't get through the Patriots fans' thick skulls, or at least that they refuse to acknowledge, that if you want to analyze something, you have to remove the variables. That's like people that keep telling me how great broccoli is. And every time they do that, they say, well, have you smothered it in cheese? That doesn't have any bearing on how good broccoli is. That has everything to do with how good cheese is. If you want to know how good broccoli is, then make broccoli and try that, right? If you're, if you're trying to bulk up for a, you know, a wrestling match or for football or whatever, and you go to weigh in and you're wearing like a weighted vest, they're not going to be okay with that. Why? Because you're adding an external variable to the, to the and they, they want to know how much you weigh. It's like, well, th- this is what I weigh. Look, I'm on the scale. This is what, no, take the vest off. So when you really want to analyze something specifically, like just the quarterback, I ju- then we have to strip away the wide receivers. We have to strip away the offensive line. We have to strip away all these variables and just look at him. Where is he throwing? When is he throwing? How accurately is he throwing? How is his footwork? What are his decision-making abilities? Basically, I want to know everything there is to know right before the point at which the, the receiver catches the ball. Receptions are in irrelevant information to me. Once the receiver either catches or drops the ball, that's when I don't care anymore because that has no bearing on the quarterback. And you could say, well, whether or not it was an accurate throw. Yes, exactly. But we can determine that before he catches the ball. So receptions are irrelevant. Yards are irrelevant, especially when the NFL takes into account after the, the play is over. That's why I always get upset with, again, Tom Brady and all this stuff, because he'll throw a, a six-yard pass to Rob Gronkowski, who will steamroll 75 defenders. You know, people are coming off the bench, people are coming out of the stands trying to tackle this guy. He steamrolls them for 70 yards and a touchdown, and they say, Tom Brady with a 70-yard or 76-yard touchdown. It's like, no, that was a six-yard pass to a wide-open seven-foot tight end. That's all the credit he gets because that's all he did. He didn't do anything after that. If you want to see what Tom Brady did, analyze what he did up to the point at which 
The receiver caught the ball. After that point, I don't care. And that's the problem with yards, receptions, even touchdowns. And, and a lot of that does have to do with the quarterback. But again, all the diagnosing gets done prior to when the actual stat gets applied to you. Now, if you're a better quarterback, you're probably going to have more yards, more receptions, more touchdowns. There is a correlation, but it's not necessarily direct. Because coaches, you know, how good your wide receiver is, how good your coaches are, all these things also factor into those things. So when you, again, with with the sentence being, um, it's the system, but a 72 quarterback rating isn't bad, and he won 11 games. He didn't win 11 games. Again, how many variables go into a win? How, it, it, it's immeasurable, the amount of variables. Left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle. Probably four or five wide receivers, two tight ends, three running backs, four edge rushers, seven defensive linemen, three linebackers, five corners, three safeties, you know, five referees, head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, wide receiver coach, on and on and on and on and on and on. And let's not forget, opponent quarterback, opponent's left tackle, opponent's left guard. All these factors, what field you're playing at, crowd noise, wind conditions, raining, whether it's raining or, or hot or cold. There's way, way, way too many variables in a win or a loss to just say, well, that tells me so. that tells me zero about the quarterback. Again, better quarterbacks usually will correlate to more wins. But as far as analyzing a quarterback based on wins, that is insanity. And it's why Patriots fans are just the most obnoxious people ever. And I don't think they need to do that. I think there is evidence that, that Tom Brady is a good quarterback. The problem is they, they can't stop using horrible information to make their case, which is why their case is just entirely invalid. And it makes Tom Brady look like a bum. Right, his touchdowns more than tripled. Again, scheme plays into that. Your, your, what receivers are there, right? What, what play is called? Again, how many of those touchdowns came from him dumping the ball off behind on the line of scrimmage and Tariq Cohen taking it in for a touchdown? And why in the world would we give Mitch Trubisky credit for that? 32 out of 32 quarterbacks complete that pass. But it's Matt Nagy that deserves the credit for calling that play. It's the offensive linemen and tight end and wide receivers for their blocking ability and Tariq Cohen's ability in space. They all get credit before Mitch Trubisky gets credit. However, Mitch Trubisky is basically the only one that gets any credit with the exception of maybe Tariq Cohen or whoever it is that received the ball also getting credited with a touchdown. Do you see the problem with touchdowns and quarterback rating and wins produce 50 more yards per game? Again, variables. There's just too many. We have to dig deeper. Why? I mean, j- just to further illustrate the point, and, and I know, I, I came into this saying I was going to be nice, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. Again, you can draw your conclusions with whatever you want to use. I'm just hoping that you change your criteria because this isn't good enough. But look at what Justin's comment was underneath Ben in the Facebook group. He said he won those games or the fact that they had the number one defense in the league was the biggest reason they won those games. So, I mean, that, that's a good point because if you change the defense, the number of wins changes. Why? Why would the number of wins change? I mean, if, if you gave that offense and that team, instead of having the Bears defense, let's just say they had the, I don't know, the Cardinals defense or, or whatever, basically the worst defense in the NFL, and they end up getting five or six wins. Maybe. Why? Why would that happen? You have Mitchell Trubisky and he won them 11 games. Why would it be less? Why would Mitchell Trubisky be a worse quarterback because they have a, a different defense? That doesn't make sense. He wouldn't be a worse quarterback. In fact, his statistics would probably go up because they'd be throwing the ball a lot more trying to catch up. Which, by the way, that's also another factor. It's easy when you can dink and dunk all day because you don't have to score a lot of points because your defense is keeping the other opponent's points lower. If that defense regresses and teams start stacking up points against them and suddenly Trubisky has to start launching beyond five yards, this, this team is in a lot of trouble. But again, the wins and losses has nothing to do with how good the quarterback is. If the defense gets worse and the Bears lose more games, that does not mean that Trubisky got worse. It's entirely possible Trubisky gets better and they lose more games because that's not a valid criteria for judging a quarterback. So again, you can judge him however you want. If you want to just look at quarterback rating, yards, touchdowns, and wins as your criteria for the best quarterbacks in the league, that's fine. If that's the case, let's, let's, let's rank quarterbacks by 
certain statistics and see how we feel about it. And then we'll look at PFF's rankings, and then you can just decide which one kind of makes the most sense based on your understanding of, of quarterbacks and how they should be ranked. Because again, we all know PFF and their grading system is just garbage, so let's find a different one. How about we start with completion percentage, because that one's pretty important. We'll look at the top 32 and see if this kind of makes sense. So in order, Drew Brees, sounds good. Number two quarterback in the NFL, Kirk Cousins. Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan, Marcus Mariota, Derek Carr, Phillip Rivers, Deshaun Watson, Cam Newton, Dak Prescott, Andrew Luck, Ben Roethlisberger, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Mitch Trubisky, Matt Stafford, Pat Mahomes, Eli Manning, Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, Jared Goff, Jameis Winston, Ryan Tannehill, Nick Mullins, Baker Mayfield, Alex Smith, Aaron Rodgers is 26th, Case Keenum, Andy Dalton, Joe Flacco, Blake Bortles, Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, and then Josh Allen would be 33rd. Does that sound about right in terms of the order? Kirk Cousins is 2, Pat Mahomes is 16th, and Aaron Rodgers is 26th. How about yards? We won't go through all of them, but we'll go through some of them. Uh, Here's the order. Ben Roethlisberger, Pat Mahomes, Matt Ryan, Jared Goff, Andrew Luck, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Phillip Rivers, Eli Manning, Kirk Cousins, Deshaun Watson, Derek Carr, Drew Brees, Case Keenum, Dak Prescott, Matt Stafford, Baker Mayfield, Russell Wilson, Cam Newton, Mitch Trubisky is 20th. I would say that order's a little bit better. But Ben Roethlisberger being the number one in the NFL, probably not so much. Eli Manning is the ninth best quarterback? I don't think so. But I don't understand why. He threw the ninth most yards in the NFL. Why do? Why does everyone keep trashing Eli Manning? Context. But we're not talking about that right now. Let's look at touchdowns. Pat Mahomes, Andrew Luck, Matt Ryan, Russell Wilson, Ben Roethlisberger, Jared Goff, Phillip Rivers, Drew Brees, Kirk Cousins, Tom Brady, Baker Mayfield, Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers, Cam Newton, Mitch Trubisky, Dak Prescott, Eli Manning, Matt Stafford, Carson Wentz, Andy Dalton. Again, that one isn't bad. Matt Ryan is certainly not the third best. He had a pretty terrible year last year. Kirk Cousins is not the ninth best. Aaron Rodgers at 13th is pretty low. Cam Newton at 4th. I guess that's fine. Mitch Trubisky at 15. Eli Manning at 17. Again, Eli. Everyone keeps trashing the guy. Why? How about touchdown percentage? Pat Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Drew Brees, Phillip Rivers, Ryan Tannehill, Andrew Luck, Matt Ryan, Andy Dalton, Jared Goff. There's your top ten. Ryan Fitzpatrick, number three. Tannehill, number six. Probably not that one so much. How about interception percentage from lowest to highest? Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Matt Ryan, Alex Smith, Dak Prescott, Joe Flacco, Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins, Carson Wentz, Derek Carr. I mean, I liked it until we got to Matt Ryan number three, but even if you accept that, fine. Alex Smith at four, Dak Prescott five, Joe Flacco six. So that's probably not not it. Yards per attempt, Ryan Fitzpatrick number one. So we'll just stop there. Yards per game, which is a metric that you had pointed out. Ben Roethlisberger, Pat Mahomes, Matt Ryan, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Jared Goff, Andrew Luck, Nick Mullins, Carson Wentz, Aaron Rodgers, Joe Flacco. Again, we'll stop because there's no way that's the top ten. By the way, Mitch Trubisky was 25th. Quarterback rating, which probably should be the best because that's the whole point of this quarterback rating, right? To rate the quarterbacks based on their stats. Drew Brees, Pat Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Matt Ryan, Phillip Rivers, Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz, Jared Goff, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Kirk Cousins. Again, not terrible, but Ryan Fitzpatrick and Kirk Cousins being 9 and 10. Andrew Luck, 11. Tom Brady, 12. Aaron Rodgers, 13. How about ESPN's quarterback rating? Pat Mahomes, Drew Brees, Ben Roethlisberger, Mitch Trubisky was fourth, so mm, Jameis Winston was fifth. ESPN needs to tweak that, man. This is bad. Andrew Luck, sixth, Phillip Rivers, seventh, Matt Ryan, eighth, Tom Brady, ninth, Jared Goff, tenth. Aaron Rodgers was rated 20th. So all of these are pretty decent, but there's always a couple people that are just way, way off, especially if you go through all the quarterbacks. You have either some really good ones that are way too low, like Aaron Rodgers, and you got some that just don't belong at all in the top 20 that are in like the top 5 and 10. Here is the passing grades and the rankings of all the quarterbacks. Drew Brees, Pat Mahomes, Phillip Rivers, Andrew Luck, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Jared Goff, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Baker Mayfield. Beyond that, Deshaun Watson, Matt Ryan, Andy Dalton, Kirk Cousins, Carson Wentz, Matt Stafford, Ben Roethlisberger, Dak Prescott, Kyle Allen, Derek Carr, Nick Foles. Continuing, Joe Flacco, Marcus Mariota, Cam Newton, Alex Smith, Jameis Winston, Chase Daniel, Case Keenum, Nick Mullins, C.J. Beathard. So I'm kind of doing these in tiers in my own mind, like about 10 at a time. I think the top 10 were pretty top 10-y. You could argue a few of these. I think Ryan Fitzpatrick was inflated because he had so many games that were just out of this world, and he had some that were just you know, average-ish. So it was a little inflated. You can maybe put, I don't know, Deshaun, but Deshaun was 11th. You can maybe put Matt Ryan, but he was 12th. So these guys aren't super far out. Then you look at the mediocre group, Matt Ryan, 
Dalton, Cousins, Wentz, Stafford, Roethlisberger, Prescott, kind of the people you would expect. Maybe Roethlisberger you'd think would be top 10-ish or a little bit higher, but whatever. They're kind of the mediocre guys, and then you get into the not-so-great guys, Flacco, Mariota. I know a lot of people like Newton, but whatever, I don't. Alex Smith, Jameis Winston, feels right to me. Then you get your dumpster fire group, Blake Bortles, Eli Manning, Sam Darnold, Sean Mannion, Matt Barkley, Jimmy Garoppolo, Lamar Jackson, Teddy Bridgewater, Josh Dobbs, Josh Allen, Mike Glennon, and then Mitch Trubisky. Now notice, he's not the 33rd best quarterback. He's only 33rd if you adjust for guys that don't play quite as much, right? Sean Mannion typically is not here. Matt Barkley is typically not here because he only played 26 snaps. But if you include everybody, he's 42nd. That's as a passer. If you look at his overall rating, he'd be higher because he's got some decent ability with his legs. But then you continue on. Chad Henney, Brian Hoyer, Matt Schaub, Jacoby Brissett, A.J. McCarron, Brock Osweiler, Garrett Gilbert, and Cody Kessler. Again, use whatever metrics you want. I like this because it, it gives me exactly what I'm asking for. It What they do with their grades is they isolate the quarterback. They look at what did the quarterback do, and they're grading the quarterback on every single play in its proper context. Whether or not the wide receiver catches it has no bearing on the grade given to the quarterback on that particular play. Whether or not the wide receiver catches it and runs for 50 yards has no bearing on the wide receiver whatsoever. Almost every single one of those metrics does. That's why I rely more on pro football focus. I want some, if if I was to hire an entire staff to tell me about how good people are, I would tell them essentially to do what PFF is doing. A, a staff that would cost me a hundred grand to hire and do all that work I'm, I'm getting from PFF for a couple hundred bucks. And again, people want to take jabs at them, but how, how, how exactly, if, if you could have any criteria you want to grade a player, what would you use? Are you seriously telling me that if you had an entire staff, an entire room at your disposal of, of super talented people and, and, and the, the task you had to give them was for them to come back and tell you who the best quarterbacks were, what criteria, what would you tell them to do? Would you tell them to count yards, including yards after the catch? Would you tell them to count the number of times receivers caught their ball? Or the number of, would you tell them to count the number of touchdowns that, that the receivers scored after Trubisky threw it? What criteria would you use, and would it look more like quarterback rating, or would it look more like PFF? I think we all know the answer to that question. I'm assuming we're all on the same page with that. So, anyways, again, I'm not mad, and I'm not trying to to kill you, as you said. I'm just trying to illustrate my point and why I say the things that I say. And, and, you know, again, part of the reason that I do it is because so many people say the opposite, so I feel constant need to push back against it. And part of it is a defensive thing, because I know what I'm saying is extreme, because I know what the narrative is. He clearly took a step forward. It's just a question of whether he took a step forward into being a top 15 quarterback or whether he took a step forward but still has a lot of room to grow. Some would say maybe he's already like a top 12, top 10 quarterback. I'm saying he got worse than his rookie year. And it's, listen, it's negligible. If you look at the grade from from his rookie year to his next year, if you want to say he stayed the same, fine. But saying he took a a big step forward, I just don't see it outside of stats, which again, stats are just a blurred version of exactly what I told you. You got advanced stats, which is a more clear version of what's actually going on. If you step back from that, it's like trying to look at a painting and then saying, I'd rather look at a painting from 500 yards away through binoculars. Dude, just walk up to the painting and look at it. All the detail is right there. I'm giving you detail and people are mad at me because they want to know what the thousand yard view is. If you want to go stand on the hilltop a thousand yards off and and look through binoculars, go ahead. I'm just trying to give you the full picture. You draw whatever determination and conclusion you want to come to. I'm fine with it. Just please understand exactly where I am and why I am. I want the correct information. I want the full context. And fortunately for all of us, uh, we're going to be getting a... um, What's that guy's name? I don't know. The guy that makes all those those um, breakdown videos does a fantastic job. His project, which is supposedly being released this week, is about Mitch Trubisky. Now, he's already been talking about it. He has said essentially what everybody knows is that he's he shows flashes of being talented, but he also shows some really terrible traits. That's going to be the crux of the video. It'll be interesting to see whether or not he believes that he's going to take a step, because that's the question I don't know. And again, for the thousandth time, if he does take a step and have a great year... 
the one thing I do not want anyone to say, because I will lose it, is if somebody comes along and says, oh, I thought he was really bad. No, dumb dumb. Didn't say he was going to be bad in 2019. I said he was bad in 2018. So don't come at me with that nonsense. Anyways, I'm going to be late for work. If I don't stop talking, probably going to be late. Anyways, you folks have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.